So welcome to the uh, second educational program of Excelsius uh, Integrated Medical Practice. And today we have the honor to have our chief medical officer, Dr. Jonathan Leibowitz, who is no stranger to the entire group. Uh, Dr. Leibowitz has been a great leader and uh, helping us with a lot of the uh, organizational needs as well as the, uh, the Ambiland. Uh, he's continuously helping us make it a very useful tool uh, for the doctor to practice medicine. Uh, today, he's gonna talk on one of his uh, uh, topic that I, uh, I find it very interesting. Uh, I've known Jonathan for years. He and I went to uh, uh, Sinai Hospital, we did internal medicine residency and fellowship. He did it in nephrology and I did it in cardiology at around the same time. But before the internal medicine training, he did his medical school and undergrad in, at the uh, SUNY Downstate seven year program, a very prestigious program. And uh, after his internal medicine and uh, fellowship, he became the medical director of the uh, Rogosin Dialysis Center in Queens. And also he was director of nephrology and dialysis at Flushing Hospital. Uh, I found very interesting that besides being a great doctor, uh, he also has special interests in nutrition and he's certified in plant-based nutrition from Cornell. And more interesting to me, uh, that he also certified in acupuncture, something that I, uh, I believe in. And uh, many patients get extreme uh, relief of symptoms of all sorts from acupuncture. Well, today he's going to talk about uh, one area that uh, is absolutely new to me and I find it fascinating, how plant-based approach can help us treat renal disease. Dr. Leibowitz, you have the floor. Okay, so we just have to share, right? Share screen. Uh, you got to unshare. I don't think so. You can just take over. I think... Uh, you cannot share while the other participant is sharing. Okay. How about now? Here we go. And I can share. Okay. Thank you, guys. Thanks for coming. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Dr. Poon. Nice introduction. Um, so we're going to talk about a whole food plant-based approach to renal disease, and I'll tell you what that's about. We're going to talk about prevention, treatment, and possible reversal, and that's really where the fun is. Be honest about prevention. I, when I finished my fellowship, actually, when I went into renal, I, I didn't go in for any other reason other than it was pretty cool. It, it was like Ghostbusters. Nobody knows renal, so whenever you have a creatinine, a protein problem, anything like that, you say, I don't know, call renal dialysis called renal. So we're the guys who come, we fix, and no one has a clue of what we did. So that, that was fun when you're young. Um, you get older, you start working, and it, it changes a little bit. So there was one night about 20 years ago, I had my aha moment that I, at four in the morning, I got this phone call. One of my dialysis patients decided, um, I don't know why, 10 o'clock at night, go out for some fast food, a lot of fast food, big bottle of Coke, and ended up in pulmonary edema in the ER intubated. So they called me, there's nothing else to do but dialyze them. You know, a couple of years prior to that, it would be like, oh yeah, let's have fun. Let's go to the ER and save this guy's life. Here I'm married, I got kids and it's four in the morning. Come on, why, do, why doesn't the restaurant guy come and dialyze him? Why do I have to do this? It's not my problem. Either way, I, it was a bad night. I stabilized him. It was too late to go home, too early to go to work. I slept in the hospital lobby and came to rounds the next morning a little early. And you, you make rounds in the dialysis unit, you get your chart rack, your nurse, your dietitian, you, you go around to each and every patient. And I look up and my eyes are fluttering, I don't feel good. And I see this guy, Mr. Jones, he's a nice guy. And I said, Mr. Jones, is that, are those donuts? He goes, yeah, you want one, doc? I'm like, no, I, I don't want a donut. Um, aren't you diabetic? Aren't you on dialysis because you're diabetic? And he's like, yeah, so what? I blew out my kidneys, big deal. So what's the big deal? I have a donut now, what's the harm? I said, I looked at him, I was like, yeah, I guess. And, and at the time I was taking care of about 500 
dialysis patients. And all but two of them had diabetes and hypertension as their cause for end-stage renal disease. So I see this thing, this 498 people walking in front of me, and I said, holy crap, this was preventable. This is optional. These people didn't need to be here. And it just blew my mind. And I decided at that point to make a career change. I'd go out and be the prophet. I'd tell these people, guys, don't do it. It's not going to end well. You could prevent this. You don't have to be on dialysis. And nobody wants to hear that. I kind of understood at that point why at that point in time, there was a half a million patients on dialysis in the US. They want to put that, you know, the doomsayer in jail. They don't want to hear from me. All right. So let, let's move on here. So what's the problem? The problem is now as of 2018, data from the US RDS, that there are close to a million, three quarters of a million uh, end-stage renal disease patients in the United States. What about the rest? They're dead. So when, when you enter this world of CKD, you it's a fork in the road. You can die die younger and earlier than you should have or could have, or you can live long enough to be on dialysis. So it's not a good fork. And no matter which road you choose, it's not a good road. Now, when you end up on dialysis, it doesn't mean you're home free. It means you're just going to die a little bit later than your friends who died earlier. So not a good situation. And we sort of should do something about it. And I'll say here, dialysis is the first artificial organ. It's a wonderful treatment. It's a lifesaver. It's fantastic. And I'm not denigrating it in any way. I'm just saying it hasn't changed in, in 50, 60 years. It's, it's a filter and it's a pump. And we, we play around with the um, timing and the flow rates and things like that. Sometimes doing it every day is a little bit better. But you know, aside from putting like a little Wi-Fi and Bluetooth and LED lights on the machine, things haven't changed. So what's the incidence? Who are these people? Well, coming in first, we have the diabetics at 60,000 new starts every year, followed by hypertensives who represent 40,000. These are the primary cause of ESRD. Of course, there are other causes down here. The others I found in my experience were diabetics who came to JFK with a note that said, dialyze me. And turned out they were just diabetic, and that's probably their story. Um, comorbidities. Well, diabetes trumps them all. A lot of people have diabetes, whether it's the primary cause of renal failure or not. And then we have a whole slew of cardiovascular disease, followed in the end by a little smattering of cancer. Why so little cancer? The reason is, is that cancer is a parasite. It loves to dig for food and nutrients in healthy people. And digging for food and nutrients in a dialysis patient is honestly like digging for water in the Sahara. It's, it's really not worth the time of cancer to do that. So it finds other people to play with. What about survival? I mean, dialysis has been around for many, many years. How survival? <laughs> not good, not good at all. And this is data, the blue is 2005 and 10 and 15. And I, I know it's not absolutely current, but this is what we can get from the US RDS at this point. And it hasn't really budged. It, it budged a little bit between 05 and 10. Reason for that is probably just a cleaning up of preventable uh, disease and deaths, a like catheter infections, bleeding, and things that could have been prevented were, but overall the, the trajectory is the same here. So what, what's the problem? The problem is that anybody here has been to a renal clinic during your training, you know, it's very boring. You don't do anything cool in renal clinic. You, you go with your attending, you see a patient, you say, hey, Mr. Smith, your creatinine is 1.5. Come back next month, you're doing great. Hey, Mr. Smith, it's 1.7, come back next month. Hey, it's three, hey, it's five, come back next month, you're doing great. And we draw a line and we plot the GFR over time. And then we're really good. We get these rulers and pencils and we continue the plot. And we say, you know what, Mr. Smith, we're over here. But in six months, you're going to need dialysis. So come on in. Let's meet the social worker. She's really cute. The dietitian, she's nice. And, and you're going to introduce her to a surgeon who's going to take a, an artery and a vein and connect it in your wrist and we'll make a fistula. And that's a lot of fun. It's great. We're going to do that. And we just need this six months for the fistula to mature. We put you on Medicare and you're good to go. And don't worry, you can work on it. You can live a normal life. Nah, it's not so easy. And, and today we're a little bit better because we have these new drugs ACE inhibitors, ARBs, SGLTs, and they push this line out a little bit. 
And we've heard about flattening. The curve doesn't work so easily. So they do push the line out. We extrapolate a little farther down the timeline. And now we say, Mr. Smith, you're so lucky you get to die before you start dialysis. Isn't that cool? Oh, well, you know, Mr. Smith, I know you had a cruise scheduled here. And that's fine because now you could start dialysis a year later and go on your cruise once. It's not what we should be doing. This is crazy. I understand you have acute renal failure. You need dialysis. It's a bridge, but it's become a treatment. It's become something that they're, they're living on. It's not even the bionic man where he gets like a fake eye that he could use forever. This is bizarre how we're, we're tolerating this. What should we be doing? We should be turning the line upward. This is our goal. We need to reverse the disease. And yeah, I know I'm nuts. It's crazy who reverses renal disease. You know, we could prevent, we'll see. We could actually do a little reversal, we'll see. Treatment, I'm not into treatment. I don't wanna treat somebody. Chronic disease means we didn't do our job preventing or healing. We're stuck with a chronic disease and it's not something I want. And you guys know you're all in practice. You don't want it either. So let's get rid of it. To do that, how do you do that? You got to talk to Yoda. Yoda is a very important guy. You must unlearn what you have learned. That's Yoda. But why? And I'll tell you, in my orientation of medical school, this is the first and last thing that I remember. And the reason is it says half of what you're going to learn over the next four years is going to be wrong. We just don't know which half. So for me, that was great. I just looked at the professor walking around. Hey, I'm a professor. And I'm going to give you all the stories I know about whatever I know. And I'd look at him and say, I'm getting lunch. You're a 50-50 guy. You know nothing. It's, it's a fl coin flip. I'll, I'll get like a 51% odds if I play blackjack right. I don't need to listen to you. But either way, this is very important for us because we, we're in this, I mean, whatever we do in medicine, this is the only way to treat. And sometimes you have to just knock that out and say, wow, we're totally wrong. We don't know what we're talking about. Let's start from scratch and figure it out. So humans do have a remarkable, and I'll tell you very personally, very remarkable ability to regenerate. And it's our job as physicians and healers to figure out how to do it. And we shouldn't just be, hey, let's walk to the grave together and we'll hold your hands and do palliative care. Yeah, that has its place when you're 100, not when you're 40 or 50 or 20 or 30. And I'll tell you myself, in 2009, I woke up at four in the morning and all bad things seems to happen to be at four in the morning. And my leg hurt, my right femur, my right thigh killed. It felt like somebody was cutting through it with a rusty hacksaw. And, you know, it got better in a week. I did whatever I did and it came back. It got better, it came back. Two years later, I went and got an x-ray. Yeah, two years, we're really good doctors taking care of ourselves. And if you look closely here, you'll see an ovoid lesion. Well, ovoid lesion needed to be a biopsy. And the biopsy was from uh, hip to knee. It wasn't a needle biopsy, it wasn't fun. They scooped out this lesion and put some metal in. Turned out that I was one of the lucky 25 year old adults in the United States that year to have a Ewing sarcoma. And that's cool, that's fun, that's great. Now, what do you do? Well, you have to do a biopsy. Well, we did the biopsy. Now you have to, the surgeon, in addition to chemo and stuff, wants to take out eight inches of femur, more or less. So that's a lot of femur. So we know that tissue regenerates. We know that bone, when you, when you break your bone, you set it, it heals. We know you cut your skin, you stitch it close, it heals. We know the liver regenerates, but this is eight inches of femur. How are you going to get these guys close together without having a short foot? Not easy. Um, in wartime, if a shell takes out half your femur, they just take the leg off. Here we have time to plan. So what does this guy say? He says, and, and you know, with all good intention, let's take your fibula, cut it out, and transplant it over here, sew it in with microsurgery, really cool, and hope it takes. And then you'll have like a fibula, and maybe it'll get bigger and stronger. And what happens if it doesn't? Well, and you're out of fibula and a femur. Didn't sound good to me. I wanted to keep my fibula where it was and sort of roll the dice. What else could I do? Put a titanium femur in. So what does that entail? Well, we just kind of take out your, most of your femur, glue in a titanium femur. You're back on your feet in no time. Only catches, come back in 10 years to change it. I said, wow, 10 years, I'm not coming back. I'm 
I want to fix this and kind of just move on. I don't want to be a patient. I don't want a chronic disease. I don't want to see you after you're done with this. And it's a good thing because 10 years later would have been about now and the whole supply chain COVID thing who wouldn't have been good. So we had a fight. I, I said, why don't we just put in a cadaver femur and it'll be a scaffold. I'll grow into it. We'll become one. We'll be friends. And he didn't want to. I wanted to. And in the end, he relented. He did it. And I, I learned two lessons. First lesson, when somebody doesn't want to do something, do not force them. It doesn't end well. And the second thing is when the guy says you're non-weight bearing, do not go on a Stairmaster. It's not a good idea. But it's not so bad either, because what happened is you see this little haze. I don't know if you can see it on your phones or what you're watching on. It's a little haze here. And, and I had that haze most of the time. And I asked about it. And he said, it's heterotropic bone. It's, it's nothing. It's, it's, it's going to be a problem later. No, don't even pay attention. So I changed surgeons, changed places, changed the whole story. Found a guy that meshed with my ideas and fixed my leg. And what was this haze? The haze was bone, real life bone. Bone that spanned my proximal and distal femur remnants and was actually at this point in time, which is a couple of years after this point, as thick as the fibula would have been. So this doesn't happen, all right? This is not one of 25 even. Nobody grows a new bone, but somebody did. So I'm stuck. I can't say it's not possible. No one can. And what happens about 10 years later? Well, this heterotropic bone overtook the femur just as I asked. So we can, and I can regenerate. And this is seriously cool stuff. And it's real. These are my x-rays. You could take off my pants and look at the scars. It's real. I'm not making this up. So how, how, do, how do we do this? And, and to be fair, um, I didn't do this with a whole food plant-based diet. There's a whole different discussion. But how do you make something regenerate? Well, the first thing you kind of need to do is remove um, the, you know, let's take you take your hand. You hit it with a hammer. You hit it once, you put the bones together, your, your hands will heal. So you keep banging it. Nothing's going to heal. It's, it's never going to heal. So if we have an insult to the body in a certain area, you know, you're smoking, your, your corners are never going to calm down. Um, so the question is, what is the um, hammer in renal disease? And the second thing you need, if I take go to a nursing home and have a 100-year-old woman who's <laughs> malnourished and hit her hand with a hammer just once, it's never going to heal. So you need the protoplasm. You need the environment for that injury to heal. Remove the toxin, provide a good environment to heal. So what are we talking about in renal? Well, we're going to look at this study. And, and it just I'm used to doing journal clubs at Mount Sinai. And when you do a journal club, you have to wear a helmet. Because if you bring up a study that somebody has something to say about, they will chop your head off. That's not what we're doing here. Every study I'm bringing up is more thought-provoking. You could argue it, do it later. Um, we could talk about how the randomization was, do it later. So let's look at this. Red meat intake and the risk of ESRD. In 63,000 Chinese adults, this is not nothing, looking prospectively over 15 years, and people without renal failure. So what they saw was very simply a dose-dependent increase in risk of ESRD in these patients. And so much so that there was like a, something like a 40% risk reduction with, with substitution. If you substituted their uh, red meat with some other protein like tofu or something like that, the risk would go down about 40, 50%. So that's wild. That's our hammer. It's not just red meat. We'll get into that. But what's fascinating here, and people need to know this, is that the highest quartile here of red meat consumers consumed 48 grams of red meat per day. Now, 48 grams, is a quarter pound is 113 grams. So this is less than half of one of those fast food burgers. It's a bite. It's a bite. People will fill their plates with ribs and steak and burgers and whatever else. These people, and most at risk here, had a bite. So when people talk about everything in moderation, all right, cigarettes in moderation, <laughs> car accidents in moderation, um, not here. We have an insult. It won't heal unless you remove it. What is our protoplasm? How do we make these people heal? A uh, case report, Brooke Goldner is a physician. She herself had lupus and lupus nephritis, bad lupus nephritis. And her story is that she reversed it with a combination of whole food, plant-based diet and combination of um, 
omega threes from flaxseed and, and greens, whatever she did, she has a protocol. But the bottom line is lupus nephritis is not commonly reversible. It just doesn't happen. It progresses to ESRD if untreated. And she is not a nephrologist, but she somehow managed to do this on two patients and report it. She used her protocol and the first woman, um, she was on the verge of a transplant and she was taken off the transplant list because the GFR went up enough, uh, 20 or something like that to get her out of danger. Well, that's cool. It took me 10 years, remember, to grow that bone. So where are we going with these patients? We're not there yet. The second patient had an interesting phenomenon. And I've seen that with my patients as well. When he was adherent to the diet, his GFR went up. When he was non-adherent, his GFR goes down. So here we have maybe the something to the whole food plant-based diet as being the protoplasm, being the environment that we need to heal. So what is this thing we're talking about? Uh, very quickly, one slide, summarize it because that's all it needs, really. It's all foods are the whole food. You're taking whole grains, whole legumes, fruits, veggies, flowers, leaves, seeds, and this is your diet. Cook them, make them, eat them raw, however you want to do it. This is your food choices. And trust me, there's a lot of them. The zero processed foods, so there's none of those veggie burgers or anything like that. Uh, no fake meats. There's no juices or smoothies. A lot of people get confused there. There's zero, zero animal products. There's no lean meats. There's no egg whites, none of that. That's actually out of style, even with Dean Ornish. Um, there's no fats of any sorts. And why not? Why not olive oil? Why not fish oil? Fish is an animal and lard and butter are animal based. But what about olive oil? Well, it takes 40 olives to make a tablespoon of olive oil, highly processed. Olive oil is better than butter, but it's not really necessarily good for you. So why? It's calories, empty calories. And it's not challenging. I, I do this with my family, my kids do it. It's not challenging, I can tell you. The challenge becomes convincing the patient simply that it's not challenging. The ones that do it are like, yeah, it's nothing. I'm not hungry. I'm fine. There's plenty to eat. There's no issue. They just, we have to get them over that hurdle. Now I have this thing, disease by diet, the nasty eight, I made it up. And there's more than eight. I chose eight because it's what we commonly know. Diabetes, hyperlipidemia, acidosis, hyperfiltration, proteinuria, inflammation, everybody loves inflammation, whatever that means. All of these contribute to a decline in GFR. So in medicine, and this is the thing, we talk whole food. The reason we talk whole food is you can't take a chemical out of a food and say that's the end all be all. We tried that with beta carotene 30 years ago. We gave it to patients. We saw that pay people with higher beta carotene levels have less cancer. So we gave them beta carotene and it turns out they got more cancer. It doesn't work like that. You need the environment, you need the whole food. You need the oil and the olive oil encased in the fiber of the olive. And it applies here too, that we all have patients who ended up on dialysis while taking their Crestor or Lipitor. Fixing the hyperlipidemia didn't prevent it. We all have patients with A1C of six by the time they started dialysis. Acidosis, they're on bicarb, we control it. The blood pressure is great. And this all happened despite knocking out some of these because you gotta knock them out, all of them. And, and the 50, the 100 other things we don't even know about yet have to be knocked out in order to have an impact. How do you do it? I'm gonna show you by switching up the diet, we'll regenerate. We'll improve the diabetes or eliminate it. Hyperlipidemia, I've had patients, the cholesterol goes down 50, 60, 80 points without meds in a matter of weeks. Acidosis improves, hypertension. I, again, I've had, I, I'm, I'm blessed with a patient population where some of them don't want any medicine. So a guy comes in a blood pressure of 180, I say, hey dude, no meds, I'm cool with that follow this diet because you can't have it both ways. They do. They come in a week or two later, 120 over 70. I had a guy actually came in three days later. He wasn't feeling well, 120 over 70, because he went from 180 to 120 in three days. With meds, we do that slowly. With diet, I don't know, never thought about it. I gave him a V8 to bring up his pressure a little bit. Um, and then we introduce the vegetables into the diet, but not just like three carrots, uh, three pieces of string beans and a potato. When you're eating a whole food plant-based diet, these things become your main dish. So you're actually, you know, when they say you can get your nutrients from diet, you don't need vitamins. For the average American, that's not true. You, you really can't get your nutrients from diet. But when your diet is these things, you actually can. So let's start with Nick. Nick is a patient of mine, very nice guy. He donated a kidney, he's such a nice guy in 2013. And 
his creatinine, I checked back and went through health fix, his creatinine is 1.1, except for one in the very beginning, must have been immediately post op was 1.2. So from 2013 to 2022, nine years, his creatinine is 1.1. His blood pressure with me was always a little bit high. It's not unexpected from a kidney donor. You lose a kidney, blood pressure may go up a little bit. Creatinine may go up a little bit also. Just remember, you, you cut off the kidney. Around February, I kind of had enough of his blood pressure, and he didn't want to take meds. I was like, Nick, what do you want to do? So he went on a whole food plant-based diet. He was good with it, no problem. I, I didn't call him back for his blood pressure. didn't really care about that. But he came back. He was having a little procedure on his back. He had some back pain. And we did a pre-op for him. First, his blood pressure was like 115 over 60. Wonderful. Second, on the pre-op bloods, his creatinine was 0.82. Now that's a little bizarre. 1.1 for nine years, goes on a diet. A month later, creatinine is now normal. Um, this is important. It's one case. I get it. Maybe it's a joke. Maybe it's a lab error. Maybe it's 5.6 tomorrow. That's all possible. But it happened. So let's just take that and hold that. Why might it be happening? Well, let's look at these two things. You could eat this, you could eat that. And what do you get from each? Let's, let's look at this and start to understand where we're going. So first with the vegetable world, we're all worried, where am I getting my protein from? If I'm eating broccoli, where's the protein coming from? And there's a thing to remember, it's called protein calorie malnutrition. There's no such thing as protein malnutrition. Assuming you get your calories from enough calories, and it's not coming from like D5W. Assuming you're getting enough calories, you're going to get enough protein. And not just enough protein, but all the essential amino acids will be from the plant world if you choose to get all your calories from the plant world. To the degree that, that when you look at protein per calorie, there's eight grams of protein per 100 calories of broccoli. And that's about the same as you get eating a cow. Six to nine, about eight figure, depending on the cut. And... That means if you eat 2,000 calories of broccoli, which is arguably not easy, you would get 160 grams of protein, which is four to six times your needs. So you're getting it. What about iron? Iron, you're getting iron from your vegetables. Believe it or not, it's not as bioavailable, but it's biodesirable. So in other words, it's a little locked up. If your body wants it, it'll take it. In animals, it's heme iron, and that's a little more bioavailable, but it's also a little more oxidative, so it'll cause you problems. And what you have now is, what do you get in the cow? Even organic, even grass-fed, even all natural, you're gonna get saturated fat and cholesterol. That's not good for the kidneys, not good for the heart, not good for anybody. You're gonna get pesticides, even in organic, hormones too. And most of all, you're always getting feces. That's how you get your B12, you're always getting feces. So some people like that, I personally don't. But what happens with the vegetable world? You're getting fiber, fiber's always good. You're getting phytonutrients and these magical things that we don't even know all their names. They do good stuff. Antioxidants, same story. We do know for a fact that you cannot take the phytonutrients and antioxidants in a pill and expect any results. It just doesn't happen. But in the vegetable, in the whole food, in its natural environment, it works, it does stuff. So let's look at some data, vegetarian, vegan data. And a little word, these diets I'm showing you are not whole food plant-based. Um, we're extrapolating, but we're using the injury and we're using the, um, you know, to the degree that people decrease or increase the meat, things happen. So we're extrapolating and, and I wanna be clear about that. I'm not showing you these and pretending it's whole food plant-based, but go with it. So uh, Adventist, Seventh-day Adventist, they're in a blue zone, they're in California. And they're relatively healthy people. They're not all vegetarians. Some are, most are, some aren't. And here's a cross-sectional analysis. Just today, on Wednesday, let's call 60,000 Seventh-day Adventists. And what are you? Do you identify as an omnivore? Do you identify as a vegan, a lacto, ovo? What are you? What is your BMI? And fascinatingly, the ones who eat meat have the highest BMI, True, much lower than my practice is average on the war BMI, I'm probably 35. But as the meat intake decreases, the BMI declines till you get to normal. And that's a very important thing because we're on the prevention thing now. Does this translate to disease? Oh yeah, absolutely. So if you take the omnivore of a relative risk of one, 
You go down, down, down as you eliminate animal products from your diet and you get to the vegan who has half the risk of type 2 diabetes than the omnivore. Now you're, you're going to ask, maybe, maybe not, is if this is so good, why are they 50%? Why aren't they zero? And the answer is that you could be, uh, I'm a vegan. Yeah, absolutely a vegan, but I have beer and chips in the morning with soda in the afternoon. And you know, you kind of get where I'm going there. So vegan does not mean healthy. What about hypertension? Third of the risk. Now that's, that's important. You know, we give people medications all the time and two, three, four, five medications. And do we say, guy, you know, put away the hot dog. We kind of mention it, but do we really say, this stuff you're eating is actually causing your disease. Not that it's healthier to take it off, but you're taking pills because you want to eat this stuff. And, you know, if you don't like the Californians, you got the British, the, uh, the Epic Oxford study, same idea. The hypertension risk is reduced in both male and females. Females, for whatever reason, less than the males. I just think they're not honest about the diet. You know, you ever meet a girl who tells her really what she eats? I don't know. Um, interesting here is that their risk in the males um, of hypertension was 15%. In my practice, I'd say it's 85%. Their BMIs are normal. They must've been healthier than my patients. I don't know what to tell you. So this is the Rotterdam study. This is every vegan doctor's dream thing. And, and there's just another one that came out recently saying the same sort of thing that we're so used to saying it's the soda and the bread and the potatoes that cause your diabetes. It's really not. It's the animal products. And here you have a longitudinal study and 7,000 patients who did not have diabetes, who ended up with diabetes, the more animals you ate, the higher your risk of diabetes. Not so with plant proteins, but the more animals you ate, the higher the risk. Now, what does this mean? Well, it means well, I'll give you one of the theories is it could be inflammation. Another theory, which is interesting too, and they've seen this in the microscope, is that there's something called intramyocellular lipid, that the, the, the muscle cells, which normally store the glucose, even the liver cells, are filled with lipid from the standard American diet, from the Western diet. And you know, in, in a simple sense, the, there's an insulin, there's a glucose load, and the insulin knocks on the door and says, open up, I got a delivery. And the guy's like, I got no room. I'm filled with all this fat. I got no room for your glucose. And the glucose goes up and that we call insulin resistance, type 2 diabetes, whatever you want. And so would removing the, the fat from the diet and removing the animals from the diet, knowing what we know here, would that reverse the process? And, and the answer is, yeah, absolutely. I've done it. There, there are many people on the whole food plant-based world who have done this. And this is my go-to with diabetics at this point. Um, I'm not going to give them a med. I'm not going to even start them in metformin usually. I'll say, dude, do this. Get rid of your disease. And if they do it, it works. You know, not everybody does it. That, that's the real issue. So I got plenty of people on, on Farsiga and Jarnia and whatever else. But so let's look at Anthony. Anthony came to me in December. It was the end of a day, a long day in December, a lot of COVID and everything else. And he's a pretty overweight guy. He's peeing a lot. And I, you know, I didn't have patience. I was a little short. I said, listen, here's your story. You're diabetic, your cholesterol is very high and, and your liver is screwed up and you're going to die young. Now, if you don't want to die young, then you could fix this. And I'll tell you what to do. Or if you think you can't do what I tell you, I'll give you meds and, and we'll just call it a day. You come back, we'll check your blood. And he goes, no, 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 I don't want meds. What do I do? And he, and he did it. He put them on the whole food plant-based thing. I wanted him back in two weeks just because... I got his labs and I was like, oh, geez, your, your A1C is nine. Let's make sure you're really doing this. He came back in two months. His cholesterol dropped about 80 points. His ALT, fatty liver, went from 186 to 26. His A1C went from nine to 6.6. This stuff works. It's wild. And I expect his next A1C to be in the fives. He's coming back soon. So this is what we do now for our diabetics and hypertensives. And Anthony, if he continues, will not end up on dialysis. If he didn't continue, he would have for sure ended up on dialysis. Scored one. So this is just another one, uh, three cohorts totaling 200,000 patients. Here they, uh, it was an animal versus plant, but it's a healthy plant versus an unhealthy plant. So like kale, arugula, and, and grapes versus um, soda and chips. And the kale arugula was inversely associated. In other words, the more kale you ate, the less 
diabetes you had, the more soda you drank and the more chips you ate, the more diabetes you had. So you could be a very unhealthy vegan. And, and we see vegans being sick. It's not unusual. And let's get more kidney centric now. We'll, we'll go back to kidneys. So this is the nurses study, a um, bunch of old white women, but they looked at them over a long period of time, something like 10 years, and found that the highest to lowest quartile of Western diet had an odds ratio of 1.77. So it's like a 70, the more Western diet, the more fat, meat, grease, chips, whatever, you're going to have a 77% higher chance of a rapid GFR decline. Yeah, it's hard to argue. And what about proteinuria development? Well, that's over double. So we love the food. We love the onion rings and, and the, the chicken nuggets and all that stuff and pizza and yeah, it's your own detriment. It makes us wealthy as doctors, makes us frustrated as doctors. It's crazy. It doesn't have to be. And that still boggles my mind. Uh, dietary acid load. This is a cause effect thing. So here we find out that it's the cause. They looked at, and, and there's a bunch of studies showing the same thing. Um, you know, if you, if you look at PubMed, you have 15,000 patients in this particular one. and they had no CKD at baseline and they measured the net acid excretion. In other words, how much acid they're peeing out, which is a surrogate really for metabolism plus how much acid they're eating. And what they found was the higher the net acid excretion, the higher the chance of developing CKD. And what was disturbing here was there was an association between an increase in net acid excretion and CKD and socioeconomic status. Why? Because when you're on a lower socioeconomic status, you have poverty, food insecurity, and you go for what's fast and cheap, and usually that's a burger. And here we go. This is called the ALCA score. It's a funny thing because you get a lot of people telling, you know, people with renal failure, what do you eat? Well, I love fish. Fish is very healthy. Fish, fish, fish. Fish is the most acidotic food on this score here, followed by the other white meat, followed by the other other white meat, and followed by cheese that people associate with milk that people think is basic. What it is, is that the animal protein presents a net acid load. And this net acid load contributes to renal failure. On the other end of the slide here, you have fruits, veggies, beans, and some pasta that actually provide a load of base, basic load and alkaline load. And what can we do with this? Can we use this to treat people? Yeah, sure. And we did. We took people, not me, but we, them, we're all one family with stage four CKD. And usually these people, stage four, they're alkalo, they're, they're acidotic. You give them sodium bicarb, gives them a sodium load. They may get a little edematous, their blood pressure may go up. But here they said, let's use fruits and vegetables, dose them like sodium bicarb. And what happened after a year? Same, it, it worked. It, it, they were able to correct the acidosis with fruits and vegetables. So bicarb gives you sodium and bicarb. Fruits and vegetables gives you base, plus all those phytonutrients, and antioxidants. And what do you see here? This is the most important part of the slide. There was no hyperkalemia. With real patients, everybody fears the banana. Oh my God, he looked at a banana, his potassium is going to go up. No, it doesn't happen. When you eat a whole food, it doesn't happen. When you have a glass of orange juice, it might happen because it's a juice. It's an extract. The potassium is free floating in the banana and in the orange. It's encased. It's regulated by its friends within the whole food. Phosphate, hyperphosphatemia is another cause effect. As soon as you go into a little bit of renal failure, phosphorus goes up, but then it's quickly buffered and bound by calcium. It precipitates in your coronaries, in your, in your kidneys, in your brain, in your heart, and everywhere. And it's not a good thing, but you don't notice it because it's constantly being pulled out by the calcium in the circulation. And for a dialysis patient, it's actually the worst thing for a dialysis doctor, actually, because everybody's got high phosphorus. And Here's a, another example of half is wrong. What they used to do 30 years ago, 40, 50 years ago, was give them aluminum, ox, aluminum hydroxide, which was a great binder, but it ended up in their brains, giving them Alzheimer's, those aluminum plaques. And what happens next? We give calcium carbonate, which precipitates all over the body. Calcium acetate precipitates a little less. And then they use these gel pills that they had to take mounds of pills a day, and it didn't even work. Now they're using iron, salts, and lanthium, and Look at that, you could actually have a plant-based diet. The phosphorus is bound within the whole food and boom, it's not a problem or not as much as a problem. These are fun slides. I love these slides here. 
that this is Japanese study. It's, it's a contest of tuna versus tofu. And this is not just canned tuna. This is Japanese tono, the real deal. And it's probably good quality tofu too. So what you see here within an hour, you have hyperfiltration in response to tuna fish. So back to that acidosis slide, the ALCA score, tuna is not only <coughs> causing an acidosis, it's not only giving acid load, it's also causing hyperfiltration and probably a bunch of other stuff we don't even know about. This slide, Barsodi used a, what he called the standard diet or low sodium diet, standard protein diet in a bunch of nephrotics. And he supplemented and switched back and forth between a uh, supplemented vegan diet and the low sodium diet. And what is a supplemented vegan? It used to be thought that vegan diets were not protein sufficient. So he would give them 0.7 grams per kilo of a vegan diet and then supplement keto acids to avoid the nitrogen load and, and toxins from that. So in the end of the day, I look at this as this, one gram is the same as 0.7. The protein amount is the same between the two. The difference is vegan. But this way or that way, when he did it, the proteinuria decreased over three months. And then he whoops, then he switched them. Then he switched them back. And proteinuria goes back up, switch them back, goes down, up, down, up, down. This is like the hyperfiltration. This is real, it's active, and it's, it's not something like moderation. It's something that really happens. TMAO is a new fun one. It's uh, trimethylene oxide. It's involved with uh, renal disease and heart disease. It's simply a product of choline and carnitine metabolism. And it goes up as renal function goes down, but it's also causative of those patients who have higher levels of TMAO. It's predictive of a poor outcome in terms of renal disease. And how do you get rid of it? Well, do we make a drug that, that eliminates or combats TMAO? No, geez, you just stop eating the meat and eggs and you don't have the TMAO problem. It's simple as that. Let me show you a couple of cases here. We have David. David's a longtime patient of mine. He has FSGS. And in the beginning, I treated him with immunosuppressants and whatnot. He Googled them and decided he doesn't want them anymore. He stopped his meds. He stayed on an ACE inhibitor. And as you see, he's got a very nice linear rise in creatinine. Now, until here. Over here, David's like, creatinine's five. He flips out a little bit. Dialysis comes up in conversation. Um, what do we do? Well, he goes on a transplant list on his own. I said, David, you don't want meds. Try it. What do you got to lose? And, and it was like a little bit of fits and starts here that he was doing veggie burgers. He thought it was a good idea. Then he was doing um, pro veggie protein shakes, thought it was a good idea. We finally got him good, and, and he actually starts turning the corner. Now, again, this is a case, and there's another case, and another case, and another case. It's a case, I understand, it could be like the stock market down today up tomorrow. It could be as a lab error, but I don't think so. I think we're onto something, but it's just too many cases. What about Eric? Eric and David are actually, they're not twins, but I call them twins. They've never met each other. They both have FSGS. They're both Hispanic guys. They're both big guys, and they both don't take meds. Now, at least David took his blood pressure pills. Eric takes nothing. So he came in over here. It looked like garbage. His blood pressure was like, you know, 180 and read in the riot act. He got scared. He did it. And what he did was he lost 20 pounds in about 10 days and his creatinine came down and continues uh, going down over here. He introduced salmon. He went down a little bit, but his trajectory is not as fun as the other one over here. And he's doing it. He's going with it. He's continuing losing weight. He curses me every time he comes in because he can't eat his meat, but he feels and looks a thousand times better. And we're really hoping the creatinine goes down. Remember, we're talking here is a month, two months, whatever it is. My leg you saw earlier, that's 10 years to really get to where we are today. For a long time, it was that haze and a lot of prayer. Sam B., another guy, comes in 2.5 in January, took off to Florida, wouldn't talk to me till he came to the office in February. What do I have to do, Doc? He was actually on meds, but, you know, obviously not going anywhere with him. He did it. And lo and behold, his granny goes from 2.5 to 1.7 a month later. Now, we don't see this stuff in renal. We see it in the hospital when like he's dehydrated, his acute renal failure, and then we give him fluids and creatinine goes back down. But these are stable, stable outpatients that generally have a linear trajectory. 
whether it's up in creatinine or down in GFR. I, I think I'm older. I think in creatinine, I don't think in GFR. And Nicole, Nicole's a lot of fun too. So Nicole, I take care of her dad. Her dad is IgE nephropathy. So Nicole came in, she's um, I think a senior in high school. She had a classic hemoshoma uh, purpura. And I said, look, you probably have uh, IgE nephropathy and proteinuria and, and uh, hematuria. So you probably have, um, like your dad, IgE nephropathy. Uh, again, I'm blessed with patients who don't want meds. We put her on a whole food plant-based diet, which she and her dad actually embraced. So it worked out really easy and well. She came back to me a week later. The rash was gone. Now, I understand the HSP rash is self-resolving, usually in a month. Gone in a week. Things that make you say, hmm, maybe, maybe not. Okay, I get it. But 11 days later, she couldn't pee that day, so she peed a quest later. Her protein creatinine ratio, a surrogate for proteinuria, was cut to less than half. And her urinary sediment was like virtually clean now, zero to two RBCs. So yes, I get it. IgA nephropathy has a variable uh, outcomes. It could spontaneously remit. This is about a week, guys. This is not a coincidence. So let's change it. So we're now we're gonna regenerate. We're gonna regenerate by eliminating the nasty eight and that kind of rhymes. So again, back to that slide again, we can get rid of all these and probably other mechanisms of renal insufficiency by changing the diet and by introducing the vegetables, you can lead to an increase in GFR. Remember, you have to stop the injury, which is stopping these things, but you also have to have the environment from these vegetables to encourage healing. And I want to conclude here with a quote from my professor from, from Mount Sinai, Jaime Urabari, my mentor, and his professor, Dr. O from Downstate, when they wrote a response in 2012, and that the key to halting progression of CKD might be in the produce market, not in the pharmacy. Now, I want to caveat this, that we, we argue about this, me and, and Dr. Urabari, he doesn't believe in the entire whole food. You can have a little bit of meat. And I say, no, you really can't. So he's talking about the key to halting. I'm talking about the key to reversing. So that's it for today. And open up the questions if anybody has anything they want to ask. Thank you very much, uh, Jonathan. It's a fascinating talk. Um, oh, it went I over mean, a half hour. Huh? so good. Uh, <laughs> Jonathan, can you hear me? I hear you. Yeah. If this is so good, I mean, uh, why don't we just use it from the beginning? Should we wait for the GFR to drop to go to... This absolutely, special diet? Absolutely not. No, I, I like I said, all of my hypertensives and diabetics, in fact, I have a shortcut now in MD land, advised whole food plant-based diet because this is how I treat them. Um, it, it's crazy. And weight loss too. It's like you're in a situation where you could eat your heart's desire and you'll lose weight. You'll, you'll float down to your ideal weight automatically. Um, assuming you're not like... Well, how are you calling that? Yeah, so that I recommend it to pretty much all my patients, except for the skinny guy who comes in with perfect bloods and a perfect blood pressure. I'm like, all right, look, you're you're that genetic guy. Enjoy it. You know, I'm I'm not that guy, and he's not that guy. But I'm not going to criticize you. Stay where you are. Eat what you're eating. It seems to be okay. But everybody else. I, you know. Yeah, Jonathan. Sure. You hear me? I hear you. you. Hear who are you? Oh yes. Um, excellent talk. Thank you. Excellent talk. And I have a question about the, uh, the prem based diet. And are you addressing the gluten and the lactin, how they affect the health that cause the inflammation? All right. So gluten, I mean, I'm giving you my opinion here. Um, I've seen in my, I don't know how many years I've been practicing, something like 30 years, I've seen, you know, I'm an internist, I'm not a GI. I've seen two patients with celiac, okay? Um, one of them was a 95-year-old woman who loved bread and would eat bread and go to the hospital. I say, Tess, why'd you do that? She goes, I just love bread. And, and the other one just doesn't touch it. Um, everybody else walks around, I'm gluten intolerant. And I'll tell you, it's not. It's the rest of the diet, maybe mixed with the gluten, that I, I can eat pizza. I love pizza. And I could probably eat six slices, eight slices of pizza. And I'll feel like crap afterwards. I'll say I, I have a headache, I'm dizzy, I'm gluten intolerant. And I could have pizza now 
without cheese, a veggie slice, I have no problem whatsoever. And a lot of it is really what else they're doing or what combinations they're doing as opposed to that. As far as lactose intolerance, um, well, humans are supposed to be lactose intolerant as are dogs and cats and most mammals that we're not supposed to have milk after weaning and therefore we're intolerant to it. Cats love milk. You give a cat a milk, a bowl of milk, they'll slurp it up and then they'll crap all over your house with diarrhea. And, and a lot of humans will too. We've evolved with the mutation to be lactose tolerant, probably survival where there was no other protein source other than dairy, um, wherever that may be, because after there's dairy, there's meat, but it's more of a mutation. But on a whole food plant-based diet, there is no lactose because there is no milk. Hope that answered. Uh, I'm, yeah, I'm, yeah I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah. I don't. I, I I don't mention about the. I don't mean the the lactose is lactin. They contain in the a lot of beans. Oh, lectin, they contain lectin. the lactin. Yeah. Ah, lectin. right. There's the lactin guy out there. Right. Yeah, they lactin. They lectin cause lectin a lot of inflammation, and... like a gall and a lot of other things. So right. can you so, address that problem? No, uh, lectins are natural things that are within a plant to defend the plant. Um, from attack by insects and humans and whatever else. Um, when, you know, beans, let's say red beans have a lot of lectins in them. When you cook red beans, you destroy the lectins. If you eat red beans that are not fully cooked and not cooked, you will get sick from lectins. Other than that, you're not going to have a problem. The, the lectin guy, I know, uh, what's his name? Read his book. Uh, according to that, you can't have eggplants and tomatoes and, and whatever else, all the nightshades too. Many, many people eat these. Um, Dr. Poon could tell you, you know, beans, beans, good for your heart, the more you eat. So all these things with lectins lead to good outcomes. So it's, it's, it's a wonderful book he wrote. I read it. Um, it's a very convincing argument, but every single health book out there has a very convincing argument. What I see is what I believe, and people don't feel better than they do eating lectins. <laughs> cook lectins, destroy lectins. So I, I don't see it as a problem. And uh, that being said, people who do do this diet with whatever you may see in these pictures, um, their CRPs go down, the ESRs go down. Um, you know, in Brooke Goldner's case, her ANA went away. Um, my CRP was zero for the record and I eat a lot of beans. Okay, so I, I do not see that as a problem. Sorry about the lac lactose lectin thing, but. What else we got? Yep. And I, I'm, I'm uh, now I'm sort of torn, you know, based on your slide, I've been telling my patient to eat fish, but fish has very high acid. <laughs> so, so maybe I say, I, I have to tell them to uh, just go to plant-based if you don't want to have any acid in your system. Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna step over the border and give you a little cardiac thing with fish that, um, you know, your colleagues, Esselstyn and Ornish, they don't like fish. Um, fish has certain fish, you know, certain salmons, you can't have as much saturated fat and cholesterol as beef. So we're all on to fish for omega-3s, but do we really have that benefit? In other words, fish may be better than red meat in, in a sense, even though the, but are we really benefiting from? And the populations that live long and eat fish are essentially like Okinawa. Japan, uh, Icarus, and how much fish they eat? Not a lot. Well, not a lot in, in the past. Now it's all American, but it would be a small piece of fish. So maybe eating that small piece of fish with a big bowl of rice, you're okay. But in America, when you tell somebody fish is healthy, they go out to Costco and buy a salmon bigger than me, and that's a meal. <coughs> and that's good money because they come in with gout. <coughs> So, you know, a tiny bit, but, you know, you, you give them a finger, they take the hand. And that's, that's the problem with all of this. You're a little bit better off just getting rid of all of it, in my opinion. Any other questions? You know, we plan to have a 30-minute uh, talk. I, I, I guess the topic is so fascinating that uh, everybody's just fixated on, your, uh, on the content of your, of your excellent presentation and I'm very uh, excited and look forward to uh, you know working with you Jonathan maybe we can design some 
study to look at this in a in a systematic and large scale uh, to to evaluate the uh, really benefit of plant based uh, diet, not only for the kidney but for other cardiovascular condition. Absolutely, I think we should. I think we're building data, and we have a bunch of patients. We're adding more every day. Hey, can I can I just have one comment? No, it seems like it oh, would be yeah. a good idea. How are you doing well? How are you doing? Great Thank talk, you. phenomenal talk. Thank you. Uh, you know, really exciting. Um, maybe I, I I see potential synergy between EECP and, and a whole food plant based diet for renal uh, disease reversal. <laughs> we were just talking about that. Maybe accelerate what we could do. Absolutely. The Jones is ahead of the time. <laughs> Well, you you read our mind. Thank you, Matt. <laughs> anytime, anytime. Great talk. Thank you, thank you. So, uh, well, thank you very much for uh, for the, all the people who attended oh, this so talk. Over there. Step oh. side over there. Any questions? Uh, in two hours. Two hours? Yes. I closed 9.30. 930, right? Okay. Well, thank you very much for uh, participating and look forward to uh, your participation next month. Thank you. Thank you. Take care, guys.